All right. So tonight is the sixth lecture on the Eov, the book of Eov. We'll be covering chapters 11 and 12. I thought that it would be a good idea to give a brief introduction to these chapters. We're going to be dealing with the third friend of Eov, Sofar, how he addresses Eov, how he sees the situation. Each one of his friends attempts his best to explain to Eov why he shouldn't complain so much, why the creator of the world is in charge, is fully aware of everything, and he does things for a reason, they're not arbitrary. But each one of the friends says it a little bit differently, they share lots in common, but they each add additional details that are important. But in order to properly understand so far, as well as the other friends, I decided to give an introduction about certain philosophical views that were very much prominent in the past, when philosophers had different opinions about God, creation, the world, and nature. Until this very day, just that today you have science that has taken over in a certain way, much more than philosophy. But what prompted people to think, which is good, was because they realized that there's so much that they don't know. And perhaps if they thought and analyzed, looked around, observed nature, perhaps they would figure out what this is all about. Is it possible for man to know what's going on? Is it possible for man to know the truth? Or is it just a guessing game with everyone having their own opinion as to what is the truth? How do you determine the truth? especially when we're talking about beliefs. We're not talking about the laws of physics, which you can easily test and come to certain conclusions. But what about life? Life is a big topic. So much goes on in life. And there's a lot of opinions and religions and philosophies. So different philosophers had different views. But the three, perhaps, main ones that are known that were very much discussed are as follows. You have the philosophy of empiricism. Empiricism basically says that knowledge comes only from sensory experience. You need to be able to feel it. You need to be able to sense it. If you cannot feel it, it's not possible for you to determine 100%. Just because somebody suggested an idea, just because somebody came up with some reasoning, no, reasoning, no. It has to be, as they call it today, the scientific method. There needs to be evidence, evidence that you can feel. Empirical evidence. No, it's something that will convince you because the evidence is there. You can see it for yourself, but you need to feel it. You have to actually experience it with your senses. Then you had rationalism. Rationalism says, no, not necessarily. There's certain things that you cannot observe. And they are right, the way Judaism sees it. Not everything is observable. What can you use to help you determine the truth? What appears to you to be reasonable? What appeals to the reason? What is logical or not logical? In other words, the mind can determine the truth. You see the difference already? Not the, sense, not the senses. You should be able to determine the truth, to ascertain the truth, by using reason. That's called rationalism. And then you had skepticism, the third one. And that's a very interesting one. But it's a little bit extreme. <laughs> There's two variations of it, at least two. One is it's not possible to have any sort of knowledge it's not possible for us, human beings, to have any sort of knowledge. And therefore, no one can claim that what he proposes is the correct idea. Or, another variation of this is suspension of judgment. Now, since we don't have evidence, we have to suspend our judgment. We don't know. So, in some ways, for them, it's easy. We don't know. But if we don't know, neither do you know. <laughs> <clears throat> That's it. Now, it is not possible, according to this philosophy, to ever know 100% the truth. Now, obviously, when we're talking about major issues of 
belief in God and so forth, it is not possible for the human mind to ever come to certain conclusions. It's true. But what is necessary, nonetheless, is there something that we could use that will help us ascertain certain things? Was, are there any tools whatsoever? Or it is really impossible. So here I shared with you three different philosophies. And neither of the three really is completely compatible with Judaism. Why not? Because Judaism says it is possible. It's definitely possible, and it's not necessarily going to be through one's senses, at least not all the time. It is to a degree going to be rational, and it's definitely not like the skeptics claim that there's no possibility to ever have any knowledge. And the reason for that is because Judaism believes in revelation. We had revelation from Hashem. Very simple. Without revelation from Hashem, then you can understand why there's so much dispute, different views. There's no revelation. God never spoke to them. How should they know? Or how should they be confident of what they're saying? How could they bring proof, solid proof, to their beliefs? It's very difficult indeed. So even though the mind is bright, and it definitely can come up with some very interesting ideas, can you convince someone else? It's going to be difficult to convince others. Judaism, however, has a revelation. So because of the revelation in Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, where we actually heard the voice of Hashem, because of the many miracles that we experienced, a solid tradition that we've been following for so long that has proven itself because of all the, what the Prophet said came true, there are many, many ways that we can prove that Judaism is true. There are many things that even though we know from the Torah, that we don't know in other areas. But we believe. And that belief is based on that very important foundation of our connection to Hashem. And He made a promise. And He said that we follow. We have no doubts, therefore, that whatever is in the Torah is the truth. We have complete clarity we don't just believe it, we know it. That's how strong our belief is. It's actually knowledge. Except for certain things that we don't have clear knowledge of. And one of them is the resurrection. Because it never happened. We've never seen it before. That's something completely new. But we believe it. So there's something called the Muna. Yes, faith. Faith is not something that you can really see with your eyes. And that you can prove to the satisfaction of every scientist. That's why it's called faith. It's impossible to prove. But there could be a lot of evidence, circumstantial evidence and the like, that you could use to base your beliefs on. And all our belief is based on certain facts that occurred in our history, on testimony. There were witnesses who saw this, not just one individual who saw it, but many, many people. No reason whatsoever to lie to the next generation to take upon themselves 613 commandments. So the entire experience of Matan Torah, when we received the Torah, the exodus from Egypt, and what followed later on, it was an incredible experience that most Jews were able to clearly see the hand of Hashem involved in everything, in everything in our life. Still, there were still questions. Moshe Rabbeinu had questions. We shouldn't have questions, of course. You may have questions, but don't let those questions interfere with your life, with your beliefs. And that can only happen if one realizes that he's limited in how much he can understand while he's alive. The most intelligent human being can never understand the ways of Hashem. Just not possible. And that is one of the messages that comes across in this book of Eov. But at least, we have an advantage over any other philosophy. We have revelation. And that's what makes the big difference. Based on that, that we have revelation, and without that it's much more difficult to know the truth, there are some commentaries who want to use this as proof that Iyab must have lived before the Torah was given. As 
may recall from the introduction, there's different opinions as to when he lived, during what era in our history. And according to this, it makes some sense that he was before the giving of the Torah, before that revelation. What I'll do right now is briefly go over the main points of Tzofar, who's the third friend of Iyob, who now comes to share with Iyob his thinking of why Iyob is going through what he's going through. Not that he has all the answers, but that's exactly the point he wants to prove. That is not possible. So we'll go through Tzofar, then we'll see what they all have in common. All the friends pretty much share certain ideas, a little bit the differences between them, then go through chapter 11 and 12 briefly. So far, it comes up very, very strong against Iyov. Basically tells him, man cannot understand anything. And as soon as you hear so far speaking, you think, wow, he sounds like the skeptics that I just mentioned. <laughs> the philosophers who believe in skepticism. Man doesn't know anything. And therefore, he's better off not asking questions. Why? Because if he asks, he's never going to get the answers. There's a famous cute story of an individual who had many questions. For God, why is this so? Why is this that way? He told his rabbi, I don't understand. I have many questions of God. He says, there's a very quick way to find out, he tells him. Go upstairs. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to go upstairs. <laughs> Once we go upstairs, you'll find out the answers. But so far tells him, while you're alive, yo, it's not possible. Even if you were to ask, you would never get the answers. This is similar, a little bit, what so far is about to say, is similar to the school of thought. Of the, the Muslims had various schools of thoughts philosophical schools of thought. And this one is similar to al ashariyatu They believed that everything is set in stone, dictated from above, and pretty much man has no say, no free will. There's no such a thing as reward and punishment for your good deeds or for your bad deeds in this world. No. And of course, this is totally not compatible with Judaism. But that's what they believed, that's all kinds of philosophies, and that was one school of thought. And they pretty much implied that any suffering that man does go through is already dictated from above. It's already predestined to be like that. Man has no say in the matter. So far, however, of course, did not exactly say that, even though he does say everything is controlled from above, nobody denies that that Hashem is in charge. But his main emphasis tells Yov, there is another dimension that is concealed from you. It is true that what we observe, we can't always figure out, but you know the reason why we can't figure it out and why we can't know everything? Because certain things we can't see. We can't know them. They're concealed. And we know that today. That sometimes you need a microscope to see those very, very small objects, some powerful microscopes that help, and telescopes that can help us see from great distances. But even that is limited. Imagine another dimension, a spiritual dimension. Can you see something that's spiritual? Man has not come up yet with a tool that can detect, observe that which is spiritual. It's a different dimension. It does not exist in the physical realm. So, so far, message, so far as message to Iyob is, you can't know everything. There's another dimension that's concealed from you. What are you complaining about? What are you talking about? Why, why say what you're saying? It's useless. There's a lot of things you don't know. So, so far as main idea behind that is, it's useless to try to figure out things according to what you see. Even though you see some strange things, some strange phenomena, you see the wicked being so successful, and the righteous sometimes suffering, it's useless to try to figure this out, to analyze it too deeply. You cannot make any judgment based on what you observe. Why? 
because the pain and suffering that you see does not tell the whole picture. There's another dimension. So therefore, what you I see is the whole picture. Besides that, so far communicates in different words to a yog that there is also a system of forgiveness, a system where Hashem is kind and good. There is such a system. And it could possibly be that Hashem is actually forgiven to the Rashaim. You don't know that. If a Rashai, a wicked man, is doing well, perhaps Hashem forgave him. Perhaps Hashem is giving him a chance, postponing judgment. And therefore, it appears to you, only appears, that's why what appears can be sometimes deceiving, that the wicked are getting away with it. They're doing well. You're not aware that there's a system of forgiveness going on. Perhaps, you know, Hashem overlooks for the time being only, momentarily, their faults. What conclusion can you draw from this? A very important conclusion we can draw from this. If Rashaim have it easy and good, the more so that the Tzadikim will have it good. Why not now? Okay. We'll try to figure this out another time. But at the very least, the conclusion should be, if Rashaim, the wicked, can have it so good, an easy life, be successful, the more so that it's coming to the righteous for doing everything that Hashem expects of them. And with this, I'll tell you a story, an incredible story that proves various points. The most important point of the following story is that even one who's not doing the right thing, one whose beliefs are completely messed up, one who you would never expect that he would ever do Teshuvah and return to Hashem, could still do so. Towards the end of the Second Temple era, and right after, as you know, the Romans were in control of Israel. They destroyed the Second Temple. Unfortunately, there were Jewish renegades. Let's just say that these individuals were trying to befriend the Romans so that they should get high positions, so that they should survive and live comfortably, for whatever reason. Not that they wanted to get away from God. Chaz v'shalom. People throughout the history did all kinds of things to befriend the enemy, their, the enemy, just to try to avoid being punished. One of these individuals, his name was Yakub Ish Tzerorot. He was the nephew of a great rabbi, Yossi ben Yoezer. Yossi ben Yoezer was being led to the gallows. There was a big piece of wood that was going in the direction of the gallows on which they were going to hang him. And in back of this piece of wood was riding the nephew of this rabbi. So the nephew sees his uncle. He sees the wood on which they're going to hang him. And he has a brief conversation with his uncle. Look at the horse that my master, the Roman, look at the horse Look at the high position that he has given me. And look at your horse. In other words, that piece of wood that your master, in other words, God, has given you. In other words, look at what I have achieved by not following the Torah. And look what you have achieved. Look at your end, having followed your master's instructions. And what did his uncle tell him? He says, if this is the way Hashem treats those who anger him, that he rewards them with the horse and with the high position, the more so that he will reward those who are righteous and who followed his instructions. If this is how he rewarded you, then for sure, the more so he will reward those who followed his instructions. So the nephew tells his uncle, who followed his instructions more than you? You're the greatest rabbi. And look at your fate. Look at what, he, what he's doing to you, what's happening with you. To which the uncle retorted, if this is what happens to those who follow these instructions, could you imagine what will happen to those who angered him and did not follow his instructions? <laughs> and as soon as he said those words, it hit him, the nephew, very, very hard. 
like poison. It was very, very sharp, those words. He just caught himself. He realized that he was mistaken and his uncle was right. His uncle had made a very powerful point that he didn't think about. And he went and killed himself with the four types of punishments that the Jewish court can uh, deliver for people who committed certain sins. He somehow arranged it that he should be able to die in four different kinds of ways, pretty much at the same time. In other words, he figured, let this be a kapara, an atonement for his sins. And sure enough, his uncle was able to see his nephew rise to Gan Eden. And he says, wow, he beat me to Gan Eden a few minutes before me because he was about to be hanged. My nephew beat me. In other words, he left, he arrived there a little bit before me. The point of this story is that you can see how sometimes people do not reflect and actually mistakenly think that just because they're doing well, Hashem is overlooking them. Not gonna do anything about it. Or God forbid that there is no judgment because of what they see what they experience. And they don't realize what Sofar was telling Iyov. There's another dimension out there that you cannot really fully see and comprehend. That was Sofar. Bildad, if you recall from last time, he mainly emphasized that the fact that people suffer is indicative that there must have been some sort of sin. Therefore, Every kind of suffering is kaparata bonot, is an atonement for sin. However, you're a tzaddik. If you're a righteous man, you will be rewarded. So he's more pointed to the fact that, yes, you don't see the reward, but not because it's concealed, it's just that it's later on. So you see the difference between Sofana and Bildad. Bildad is focusing on the suffering is there for a reason, it's not arbitrary. Reward, of course, Hashem rewards the righteous. But where is the reward? I can't see it. Neither could with Yossi ben Yoezer could we see all the reward that was awaiting for him. He was a big rabbi. That's because it's later on. Hashem does not reward right away. does not reward this physical reward. And the simple reason is because it should not interfere with free will. So, so far as focusing on the fact that there's something concealed that you don't know, Whereas Bildad will say more that it's there. We know it's there, but it's later on. What do they have in common, the three friends of Eov? What do they all agree on? Because a lot of what they, each one says, the other one says too. So what they have in common is that they all agree that Hashem Shofet, Upoel Tzedek, Hashem judges, Hashem is just, Hashem is righteous, Hashem does everything for a reason, Nothing is arbitrary. A righteous man will get what is coming to him. A wicked man will get what is coming to him. They all agree on this. They agree on that pain and suffering is also kapara, it's an atonement for sins. No doubt about it. No one just suffers for no reason whatsoever. They all agree on this. And there's somewhat of a consensus as well between the three of them that it's a good idea for you to do teshuvah. Because through Teshuvah, one can actually improve his situation through repentance. The belief that comes across here from all three is that Hashem is involved in this world. He's in charge. He listens to us. He's aware of us. Don't therefore ever think for a moment that just because you can't figure things out, that means everything is arbitrary, which is part of the problem that Yov has. He believes in God, of course, but he seems to say that Everything is arbitrary. It doesn't make any sense. I can't figure this out. And this bothers me a lot that I can't figure it out. Why doesn't Hashem let me know? Why doesn't He explain it to me? If I have a sin, let Him reveal what my sin is. So I'll know what to fix. And sometimes <coughs> Hashem says, you don't have to fix it. I'll fix it for you. <laughs> with, uh, with pain and suffering. Obviously, if we know what we need to fix, and we should try to examine ourselves, then we should go about it. It's a lot better that we fix it and Hashem fixes it. But if we didn't do it, Hashem has many ways of fixing, of atoning a sin. In other words, all three agree.
agree that you know, there must have been something wrong that you or your children did for you to experience what your experience is. But what's the difference in style between them? Eliphaz was a lot more gentle and sensitive in his approach. Basically, Eliphaz's message was, it's human nature to make mistakes. Man is born imperfect. No one is perfect. It's almost impossible that he should not trip, make a mistake. Don't think that you're so perfect. This is very similar to what Shalomo Melech Salomon says in Kohelet. There's no such a thing as a righteous man in the world who will only do good and never make any mistake. He would be an angel. He wouldn't be here. So that's the Lifaz way of trying to convince Yov, even though you can't find where you went wrong, what mistake you did. You don't know everything. Perhaps what you think is not a mistake is a mistake. After all, man is not perfect. Bildad was a lot more forceful than Eliphaz. And he says openly to him, ah, it must be your children are to blame. They must have did. You don't know anything about yourself, but your children could have done something terrible that you don't know about. Because after all, pain and suffering is always as a result of sins. So Bildad was much more forceful in his saying that, Yo, you're wrong in the way you're thinking. Just because you can't figure out, you don't know of any sin, there for sure was a sin. Comes along the third one, who we're talking about tonight, so far, and he is the most aggressive of all. If you are to read those two chapters, especially chapter 11, because chapter 12, Iyov answers back, you will see that Sofar's way of telling Iyov off, of rebuking him, is a lot stronger than the other two, even though he is apparently the younger one of the three. Throughout the book, you will see that the friends have various conversations. We're just almost through with round one. There's a round two, and then there's a round three. And all of them except for so far participate in the first two rounds. The third one, he doesn't participate. The other two do. So, so far says that the Tsarot, the troubles that he's had, Yov, those are few compared to what you really deserve. <laughs> Imagine telling somebody that. What you went through? Yeah, that's little compared to what you really deserve because of your great sins. Yov, if your request would be fulfilled that Hashem should explain to you and show you what you did wrong, you would actually see that Hashem was kind and compassionate with you, that He only made you go through this. You see how his words are much tougher. You should be thankful. <laughs> thankful. It's very difficult to tell that to somebody who's going through what you're going through. But so far, that's his style. He says, you don't know anything. There's another dimension out there. And I can tell you that what you're going through is peanuts, as they say in English, compared to what is really coming to you. If only Hashem can show you, what you really did wrong, you would see that he was actually lenient <laughs> with you. He was lenient. You know what? He's right with saying this. Even though he was wrong to communicate this to you, it's very not sensitive. But that's a valid point. Hashem never, never will give us everything that we deserve, God forbid. Hashem is not interested in that. We have several prophets that tell us that. Hashem is not interested in the wicked dying. He would rather him repent and return to him. Does Hashem just want to get rid of the wicked? No. Punish him, get rid of him. No, he would rather him return to him. So, yes, Hashem will not necessarily give you everything that you may deserve. Hashem is lenient, forgiving, gives people a chance, postpones the judgment perhaps. And definitely considers other merits that the person may have on his record. I've mentioned this perhaps in the past, that there was a uh, woman that came to plead with the judge. 
her husband was just sentenced for 25 years in jail because he stole. He was a thief. He was caught. 25 years in jail. The woman says, I understand he's guilty, but why am I guilty? Why should his kids be living orphans? What are they to blame? Why should they be without a dad for 25 years? And what did the judge say? I'm sorry, but that's the law. I cannot take that into consideration. He committed many, many crimes. I'm not just giving him 25 years for the fun of it. This is what he deserves. This is the punishment becoming. This is the punishment that is due to someone who committed all these crimes. I cannot consider your problem. You indeed have a big problem to be a widow, almost like a widow for so long. But that's the law, I need to follow the law. No room for leniency here. But that is not the case with Hashem. Hashem does consider the whole picture. If this man is a wicked man, but his wife is righteous, good woman, the children never committed any wrong, Hashem will postpone the judgment. If they don't deserve to be orphans, if the woman does not deserve to be a widow, they will not go through that experience, Hashem will push it off. He will give him a long life perhaps, and at the end, maybe towards the end of his life, something will happen to him, and if not in this world, then in the world to come, in the afterlife. Hashem can take in the whole picture. Hashem does consider that's part of Midat al-Hamim, that's part of his compassion. It's not just strict justice. Some people have this philosophy, this way of thinking. Strict justice, you can't change it. What about forgiveness? What about uh, doing Teshuvah? They don't know that this exists. And that's why they think that's it. Perhaps if they've committed all the wrongs and all the sins, that they have no way to go back and fix it. Hashem says, you can always fix it as long as you're alive. It may be difficult to fix everything, but Hashem will help you. Never give up hope. Never consider yourself a wicked man that has no more chances. And that's part of what Sofani is telling you of. You don't see everything. If you could only see, you would see actually how Hashem is lenient towards you. And therefore, because Hashem is so lenient with you, you know how much you owe Him? You owe Him a lot. If you recall, David the Melech says something similar. What can I give Hashem in return for all that He has done for me? He's done so much for me. I owe him so much that he's protected me from my enemies, saved me in the battlefield, done so much good to me. And remember, David and Melech suffered a lot too. He's focusing on all the good that Hashem he says, and what can I do to return that favor? David and Melech realizes he should be returning the favor. He should be doing something in recognition that Hashem was so kind to him. Another way of saying this is, it could be a lot worse. Sometimes people go through situations. It may not be comforting to hear that, but the reality is sometimes it could be a lot worse than what he's going through. Imagine somebody got into a car accident. God forbid it. It's a terrible thing. Obviously, you know, he's okay. He's shaken up, maybe bruised. The car is gone, but it's just a car. But he's alive. Oh Hashem, bruised, shocked, perhaps with back pain too, but he's alive, he'll recover. Could it be worse? Of course it could be a lot worse. A lot worse. I don't even want to give you all kinds of possibilities that could have happened to him. In a car accident or in some sort of other accident, all kinds of terrible things. Let me ask you a question. I don't know which one is worse. God forbid, I don't want to compare. What if somebody was using a machine and it chopped off a few of his fingers? He's alive. He was in pain for maybe a couple of hours until they bandaged him. Which one is worse? I don't even want to say. <laughs> Obviously, people who lost their fingers. Yeah. People who go through all kinds of illnesses. All kinds of illnesses where they're in bed for a long time, and they come out of it. We don't know. Who are we to judge which one is better, which one is worse? 
We just know that Hashem is in control. He knows exactly, exactly how much pain is suffering to bring to an individual, what day and moment it will arrive, and what day and moment it will leave him. That's what the rabbi tells the Gemara. Pain and suffering have an exact time. When they arrive, when they go. With Rabbi Uda Nasi, there was one case where he suffered for 13 years. After 13 years, the pain was gone. It could be five hours, 15 minutes. I don't know. Hashem knows exactly how much is coming and never will one get more than what he deserves, necessarily. Even though it does say that the Jewish people got a lot more than what they deserve at certain times during their exile, but that's just to increase their merits. Hashem says, because you went through a lot more pain than you really deserved, I will cut short your stay in Egypt. I will make the redemption out of this long exile easier for you even though there's a lot of accusations. So, the system that Hashem has is a perfect system, just that we don't fully understand it. That's all, it's our problem, not Hashem's. So, so far makes a very powerful point here. Yog, if anything, you owe so much to Hashem, He's being kind to you, more than what you realize. So, if you look at the words of Tzofar, you will notice that he rebukes Yog. And in, his, and in his rebuke to Yov, he makes sure to remind Yov, even though we see later on in chapter 12 that Yov says, I'm fully aware of what you're saying. You're not telling me anything new, but still. He gives so far a chance. And so far he rebukes him and says, the chokhmah of Hashem, the wisdom of Hashem is incredible. Compared to man's knowledge, man is nothing. How could you even start comparing yourself to Hashem? Hashem's chokhmah is incredible. You can't compare it to the human mind. And therefore, you have nothing to lose, as we've seen before, in doing teshuvah. Because teshuvah is for sure going to be helpful for you. Figuring out, you can, because your knowledge, your ability to understand Hashem's chokhmah is impossible. Therefore, you, you don't lose anything. On the contrary, you only gain by doing teshuvah. That's one part of his rebuke. Then he tells him off for talking so much. You think that's going to make you any better? It's going to make you more of a tzaddik? Trying to complain, trying to talk, trying to argue. That's not going to change the situation. Nobody will believe you more because of that. You have to be careful sometimes. As we've explained in the past, when a person does get a dose of pain and suffering, if he accepts it, I'll complain out of love. He says, it's coming to me, I don't know why. Then that pain and suffering is very powerful, very effective as an atonement. If one starts arguing and complaining about it, then the Shem says, I'm going to double it. We don't want that. So, Tzofar continues to rebuke Yov. He says, don't make it more difficult, more complicated than what it is. Just accept it. And as far as your question, why doesn't Hashem explain to you? That's one of the questions that he offered. Why doesn't he explain to you why he brought about this punishment to you? The simple answer is, the chokhmah of Hashem, we cannot fully comprehend. So only Hashem can know what you did wrong. As I said before, it is possible that what we think is okay, Hashem doesn't think it's okay. It is not possible for the human mind, therefore, to fully comprehend what Hashem expects of us. Even though we know the basics, we have a guide, we have the Torah, we have the Anacha, but sometimes it's difficult to figure it out. You could have done a lot more, you could have done a lot better. You didn't do it with the right intention. You did it only for your self-aggrandizement when you helped someone. You didn't do it because of the mitzvah. Imagine something like that. That's not right, even though it's not a big sin, he still did the good deed, but for the wrong reasons. The greater the person is, Rabbi tells us, the more Hashem is exacting with him. Expects of him a lot more perfection. You should know better. Why are you doing it for your own honor, not for my honor? Hashem was very upset at the Jewish people. There was an incident of Pilegesh Bagiv'ah, if you ever read that incident. 
in the Tanakh about this concubine that was violated. I'm trying to use more tactful words. And that caused a tremendous civil war amongst the Jews. A lot of the tribes were very upset at how this bunch of people from the tribe of Binyamin committed this rape. And we're not getting into all the details of that story because it's really, really sad what happened there. What was going on? Why did Hashem allow so many Jews in the wars that followed, the battles that followed, to lose? A lot of Jews were killed in battle trying to fight each other over here, trying to take up the honor of this man whose concubine was uh, treated in such a terrible way. They should have won the wars. They were fighting for a just cause. This was terrible. Of course we can't tolerate it. So why did they lose? So many Jews lost their life in a just battle. You know what the answer is? Because Hashem was saying, for your honor, you fought and you went to war. What about for my honor? How could you allow there was an idol? There was an idol close by to the house of Hashem. How could you allow the idol of Micha to be there? You should have eliminated it, eradicated it. Where is my honor? Why don't you fight for me? So here they're doing something right. And Hashem is reminding him, yeah. You're doing something right, but you're doing it for your honor here. Well, what about for me? How come you tolerated that? And this you don't tolerate? It doesn't make any sense. That incident is a very, very tragic incident in our history, but there's so much to learn from it. It's, uh, it's a very difficult incident to even go through because if you read the details of what happened there, you wonder, wow, so many lives lost for just something like that. One woman was treated the way she was treated. And everybody went to war for that. She says, yeah, let me teach you this important lesson. You fight for my honor, not just for your honor. So Tzofar continues to rebuke Yov. Hashem knows exactly what you may have done wrong that you may not know of. And you may not figure it out. You may not ever know what is wrong. Hashem knows exactly what you did wrong. So as you can see, so far, just like the other two friends, they are pretty much in agreement. There must have been something that you did that was not right. But that is not where he focuses the most. So far is not focusing on the sin here. He's focusing more on, yo, it's not possible for you, even if you would love to know, to ever, to ever be able to figure this out. Hashem will not give you the answers. Not all your life. Instead, just try to do Teshuvah. So far continues on to say, he tells him, man is like an ayer pere. Ayer pere is like a wild donkey. I think the right translation of, of ayer in Farsi would be olar. Right? Yeah. But what is he saying here? It's not just any donkey. It's a wild donkey. A wild donkey? has no chokhmah bina, doesn't have too much knowledge and understanding. Some human beings are like the donkey. They don't have proper understanding. That's why they're, they're donkeys. But he reminds Yov that because an animal cannot possibly ever have chokhmah bina, even though man is wiser and does have some chokhmah bina, Still, he's limited. Like I told you the story with the cat. Remember the story with the Rambam? Some doctors were jealous of the Rambam of Maimonides that he was beloved by the king, famous doctor. And they wanted to show the doctor that he doesn't know what they know, that they're more capable and knowledgeable than he is. And they said, Doc, and they said, Your Honor, we can train a cat to walk on two feet and to be a waiter. The Rambam says you can never change the nature of a cat. A cat is limited. You cannot change the nature of the cat. We're going to prove it to you. You're going to see you don't know anything. And they trained the cat. One day, when they came to demonstrate, 
a cat walks in with a tuxedo, with a, uh, a tray, cups, cups of arak, <laughs> some other drink. And the Rambam was ready for them. He goes to his pocket, takes out a mouse, and drops it on the floor. As soon as the cat saw that, it dropped the tray and ran after the mouse. And the wrong one. <laughs> See, I told you, you can't change the nature of the cat. You can't make a cat a mechanic. How much does it know? Hashem made the human being wiser, gave him chokhmah binavadat, but still he's limited. He is born an iron parent. The fact that, however, that so far mentions that he's born and he's like an iron parent, a wild donkey, the commentators explain is to remind us that when we are born, we're raw in our nature. We need to develop, we need to refine our character. We're not perfect when we're born. Yes, that's true, we're imperfect. We're like a wild donkey when we're born. Raw nature, but you can still perfect it. That's part of man's job, Jew or non Jew, to refine his character. So far, pretty much towards the end tells Yov, but you should know that Sadiqim are good people. In the end, they will be rewarded. Everything is bashkacha, nothing is arbitrary. The shayim, the bad people, in the end will lose everything. They will suffer. So what you observe right now, their success of the evil, of the wicked individual, is only temporary. And in the end, when the rasha really goes down under, he won't have who to turn to, because he doesn't believe in God. He never did. So he will not be able to survive. He will not think of teshuvah. So, you're looking at perhaps one, two, three frames of people's lives. You don't see the entire picture. At some point, the righteous man will be rewarded. The wicked man will suffer, will be defeated, will fail. This is pretty much what Sofar tells you. In chapter 12, he has turned to talk back, to answer Sofar. And he tells all his friends, None of your words has any chokhmah. <laughs> you didn't tell me anything that is wise here. He tells them, I also have experience. I'm also a chacham. <laughs> what do you think? I don't know what you're telling me. You didn't say anything new to me. And he points out that he also has chokhmah because Sofar indirectly told him, Sofar indirectly told him that man doesn't have that much chokhmah. No, no. Says, I know a lot. I learned a lot, I have a lot of experience. However, what you've told me did not help. What all of you told me was not helpful. And he's, he says various words to express how he, he doesn't make anything of what they told him and compares what they told him to a torch that is about to be extinguished. It's about to go out, the flame what's left to do with the torch, to throw it out, right? After its flame is gone, after it's done what it needs to do, there's nothing left of it, except to throw it out, dispose of it. He says, that's exactly what you told me. What you said to me is just like that flame that is about to go out. It's useless. I can't do anything with it. It doesn't help me. Why doesn't it help me? He says, you guys don't understand the metziut the reality that we observe, what we actually see, is a lot more powerful than anything you could say. It's a fact. The Rasha is doing a lot better. Don't try to teach me philosophy here. Don't try to tell me all kinds of cheshbonot, all kinds of, all kinds of calculations of there's another realm, there's another dimension, there's this, there's that, there's sin. Just, all I can tell you is that the reality is a lot more powerful. So he's a little bit touching on that philosophy that I told in the very beginning of empiricism. What we experience physically, what we feel, that's significant. It's, just, it's a fact. Can't you see? They live in a mansion, these weaker people. 10,000 square feet mansion. And they have maids, and they have so much money, and they're enjoying life. And I see that they're enjoying it, they're not suffering. So, so the metziut, the reality is a lot more powerful than anything that you can tell me. Look, he says, he continues on to say, they are in peace, and the righteous ones 
are suffering. In other words, the evil people have it easy, while those who are searching for Hashem have it difficult. It's observable. That you can see, like the empiricists. We, we, we see it. We can feel it. That speaks for itself. And as far as you're telling me about the Chokhmah, the great Chokhmah of Hashem in nature, I can tell you, Yov says, that even animals know this. Even animals know who created them. Even animals, to a certain extent, have Chokhmah. So, the fact that you're trying to impress me that Hashem has so much Chokhmah, look what He did, look what He created. So, yeah, even animals know that. So what? In other words, you didn't tell me anything I don't know. It's nothing new. You know what's real Chokhmah, he says to him, to Sofar, chapter 12. Real Chokhmah, real wisdom is being able to distinguish between one thing and another. In the same way that the palate can distinguish taste from taste, he says, right? You can taste sweet or sour. In the same way that the palate can distinguish the tastes, that is Chokhmah. Chokhmah, real Chokhmah, can distinguish one thing from another. Therefore, so far, what you told me has no taste. <laughs> Real chokhmah, you should be able to distinguish between things. So, the fact that Hashem has tremendous chokhmah, ukvura, tremendous might, that's understood. You're not telling me anything new. Towards the end of the chapter, Yov continues to elaborate, and you will see this a lot later on too, about what Hashem does in this world. It's, it's incredible. You're able to follow the translation. He says like this. Look what Hashem does in this world. Hashem can destroy. Hashem can destroy certain things in this world that you are never that you are never able to fix or rebuild. Take for example, he says, water. Water is a tremendous source of blessing. Water brings life. But Hashem can transform that blessing to a curse. If He eliminates the water, it becomes dry. Or if He brings too much water, that is destructive. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a boom. And He continues on to say, Hashem also has the might, the strength, to give encouragement and strength to those that He wants to or to weaken those that He wants to. Hashem has those abilities. Hashem knows that people make mistakes. Obviously, He would be able to distinguish between that which is done intentionally versus that which is done unintentionally. But Hashem also puts the Satan in the way of man to make him fall intentionally. So this is the way Yov sees everything. This is the way he analyzes through his own way of thinking and his own philosophy. So, so far, he's just saying that Hashem has all that ability. Everything is from Hashem. What else does Hashem do? Hashem can even misguide the leaders of a, of a nation. Hashem can misguide the wise, the Chachamim. He can confuse them. But even they who are chachamim, who are wise, should make mistakes. He can even bring about that a person who's a good orator, a good speaker, should stumble, should, be, should make a mistake. That's also Mishamayim. Hashem can make the judges make a mistake. So look how much Yom is aware. And a lot of what he's saying is true. We're going to soon see where the problem is. But so far what he's saying is, I'm aware of Hashem's chokhmah and his abilities. Look what Hashem can do. Hashem can remove the chokhmah if he wants to in one minute. He can bring someone Alzheimer's, God forbid, or something else. The chokhmah, the greatest chacham, he may have been, no longer chacham. Those who are honorable people or in high positions, Hashem can bring them to shame, can humiliate them. All of a sudden they're exposed in the news for something that they did 25 years ago. <laughs> That's it, their reputation is gone. Hashem can make that happen too. 
There are some, he says, that Hashem elevates, elevates to power. For one reason, only to bring them down later. So you first have to elevate them. And then when you fall from a high position, then you really feel the pain. If that person would never have been in a high position, he wouldn't have felt the pain. So sometimes Hashem elevates. Look what he always saying. He understands a little bit of what's going on. I, I, I know Hashem can do that too. Elevate someone only to bring him down. Hashem can also give wisdom to those who are not knowledgeable. And all of a sudden, this man, who is okay, I mean, he is knowledgeable, but not so much, all of a sudden, he makes a major discovery. Inventors discovered all kinds of things that others did not know. Hashem gave them that chokhmah to discover something that was not known. And others who are greater chachamim, who are wiser, Hashem did not give them any extra chokhmah. On the contrary, He held it back from them. They tried hard, perhaps, to figure something out, and they could not figure out. Comes among this average individual who's not as bright. Hashem gave him the Chokhmah and he was able to figure out the solution. Sometimes Hashem elevates a nation, they become an empire. But at the end, what happens to them? They disappear. Hashem puts a trap to bring about their fall. It could be through some sort of trap even. It could happen in so many kinds of ways that Hashem will bring someone down. Or an empire, an entire empire can come crashing down once Hashem has decided, in all kinds of ways. So when it comes to the wicked, Hashem causes them, He says, to make all sorts of mistakes, and they will appear as fools or as drunken individuals who cannot distinguish right from wrong, who are like blind people in the darkness, not being able to, to know what to do. Individuals who are completely settled in their business, completely calm about everything, with no worries, and all of a sudden they're at the loss. Hashem makes them as though they're, they're drunk, not being able to be coherent, not being able to think right. Who's that? Who's causing all of this? Hashem. So in conclusion, so far tells Yov, and he tells, I'm sorry, in conclusion, Yov tells his friends, Hashem, through his wisdom, controls everything. I know that. That I know. I just shared with you what Hashem is capable of doing. But my problem is, I don't see him distinguishing between a tzaddik and a rasha. I don't see it. That's his main complaint. I don't see it. You know, I need to see it. <laughs> he wants to be able to observe some difference. It hurts me that I cannot see it and not know why certain terrible things happen to Tzadikim, real Tzadikim. It appears to me that the Shogeg and Mezid, the unintentional and the intentional sin, is exactly the same thing. Why should it be like that? It gives the appearance as though Hashem is out to get you with all His might. Hashem wants to punish. Hashem wants to make it difficult for man. I don't understand why. That's pretty much how this chapter ends. What I would like to just add is an interesting limut schut. I'd actually like to give you over here the benefit of the doubt. I haven't seen anybody say this. I think it's a very interesting idea. What could you say about Yom that's good here? Even though remember, Yom is a righteous individual. But here it appears to that he's having trouble. He's struggling trying to figure out Hashem's ways and make some arguments even though a lot of what he's told is correct. Yom, you can't know everything. Something good about a Yom that you can say here is that the Yom is pretty much expressing what Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, said to Hashem, Hashem, you're upset at the Jews. You're going to kill them in the desert? Why should the Egyptians come and say, you see, even their God, was upset at them and killed them in the desert. You know what's going to come out if you kill them? Moshe tells Hashem, even though they may deserve it, but this is going to desecrate the name of Hashem. We want your name to be elevated in the world. If you do something like that, even though it's coming to them, 
what will come out of it? Nothing good. Even the Egyptians will be happy. And they will prove it that these were not good people. They will prove it that Hashem is against them. They will use this as an example that God wanted to punish them and therefore He did what He did to bring them out of Egypt and kill them in the desert. How will that look in the eyes of people? Hashem, you wouldn't want that. But that is the impression that people should get. And I'm thinking perhaps the young also is thinking the same. Hashem, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right that you shouldn't distinguish at all. That Tzadikim should be suffering so much that all of the Rishayim, or at least many of them, should be prospering. They don't deserve it. And we know that. And you are a just God. Now, how come you allow this to happen? That is where his problem is. I mean, it's a good point. Hashem, your name should be sanctified. That the world should see the mighty God should be able to feel it, know it. Obviously, we said that this would interfere with free will, but at least from time to time, an open miracle perhaps. Yov wants Hashem to reveal himself a lot more, not to conceal everything, so that people should not be so mistaken in their understanding of Hashem. So, Yov, even though he answers back every one of his friends, even though he tells them all off that you did not calm me down, your answers did not do me any good, you did not provide to me answers that are satisfactory. What do we see from everything that Iyob has said? That Iyob does not give up hope. That is clear. With all the questions that he has, with all his arguments, that there appears to be no seder, no organization, and no real apparent law in this world, divine law, and on the contrary, it appears to be that the Hanhaga, the, the divine providence, is very arbitrary because he doesn't see any difference between the righteous and the evil. Iyov, however, makes a very, very good point. I'm still going to continue to ask. I'm still going to continue to search for answers. I'm still going to try to figure out why Hashem, when he gets out on why he directs this world the way he does. Very important point, he says, that even though you may not know the answers to all the questions, and we never will, because we're limited, still, we should have that aspiration to continuously search for the truth, to ask, and to try to figure out as much as possible what are the laws of Hashem in this world. This is welcome. This is definitely positive, and God willing, is that Hashem. If we learn, the more we learn, the Torah, we will, of course, gain a lot more clarity in the chef's ways. Yeah.